name is Pip. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Um, and then Katie, whose pronouns are she, her, is going to do most of the content this evening. We're both from uh, the Kite Trust. So we are a uh, charity based in Cambridge, Sheer and Peterborough. Um, and we work with LGBTQ plus young people uh, delivering uh, one of our main services is youth work. Uh, and we work with young people up to the age of 25 and most of our young people are uh, in that kind of teenage age range. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about how to create inclusive and engaging online spaces uh, for young people. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Katie, who is the expert in this and has been delivering it uh, since, oh, since March when we very had to rapidly uh, learn this particular field. So over to you, Katie. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so here we are, officially in lockdown, but now what? So our very first week, um, in the very first month really, we started a whole bunch of new things and we've been trialing them out and I'm here to share a, um, a little bit of what we've done, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, like Pip said, we've started our social group since March. We've changed the times, we've changed the participants, but we've always kept our social groups going immediately um, after lockdown started online. And we've tried all the different platforms, Zoom. Um, we have Zoom and GoToMeeting as our main ones. Um, GoToMeeting is a little bit more secure, so we do all of our staff meetings through GoToMeeting. Um, but we have Zoom at, for our training platforms and like a backup in case we need to do two meetings at once. So that was kind of a, um, not a learning experience, but it was like, oh gosh, we only have one room to work out of now. Um, since lockdown, we've started a newsletter um, and we send it out every week. So forming a newsletter me meant we had to have a mailing list. So previously we'd done everything through like individual email. Um, so we started using MailChimp so that way we could send to everyone at once and they had the option to unsubscribe if they would like. Um, and the, the newsletter has not only opportunities of what we're doing, but opportunities from other places around Cambridge and online things like recommendations um, to keep them busy. And it's also full of like cute memes and stuff um, to keep them watching. Uh, but I really enjoy doing that. And I think it's been really helpful because it's just like a stable, it's coming every week and you're gonna know what's happening next week because of it. Um, we stepped up our social media game. So we had been doing uh, some Instagram and Twitter beforehand, but really since lockdown, we've increased it tenfold and we've learn a little bit about making the images um, more cohesive. We've learned about stories. We've, we've learned about all these different things. And I think it's a really nice way to connect with our audience, um, which is young people, because that's where they're at. Um, we started a podcast, which, which meant we also had to get young people to do the interviewing. Uh, so it's called I'm Socially Distancing With. And, in it, we interview influential and important, interesting queer adults who have careers and lives and just get to know them a little bit, give them an opportunity um, to earn some income during lockdown for people who are relying upon gig income. And, uh, and it also gives our young people um, you know, the opportunity to, to increase the interviewing skills, the conversation skills, the digital skills, and bump up the, the CV. Um, and we've done some special programming. So besides our social groups, we also have like um, Netflix party, which is a different way for individuals to get together and talk about what's happening on the screen. Um, we found that in the summertime, people were outside. So we're saving that program for uh the fall and the winter when it gets colder that's when we're going to start it back up but we also started D, D dungeons and dragons which has been excellent uh and i love it don't get me started and um we also do some collaboration with other art artists so 
We've um, sent materials out. We've had artists come in and do workshops with us and um, we're working closely with them so we can pass those opportunities on to our young people. So I tell you all this to just to show you about how much we've learned in this time. And I'm hoping that I can pass this on to you. Um, so the expectation for today is that you learn how to create a safe and inclusive environment. You get the kids to participate, dang it. And you know, you walk away with some tips and tricks that we've all learned through experience. Um, and I hope that sounds good to everybody. So, uh, Pip, I'll have you do this bit. This, the first yeah, thing yeah. is safety. Cool, so I'm gonna uh, jump in and talk about uh, the little bit of uh, policy and procedure stuff and safeguarding that we did uh, before uh, our youth work team, uh, Katie took it, took it on for the delivery. Um, so really underpinning creating inclusive and engaging environments online is creating those in a safe way. Um, so firstly, using a secure web-based delivery system. So using uh, and uh, a kind of trusted provider, so Zoom and GoToMeetings have inbuilt security features uh, so that you can uh, implement safeguarding policies in uh, how you are delivering, particularly to children and young people. Uh, some of those include setting an entry password so that you can really uh, narrow down who has access to that space by who you give the password to. Uh, also things like using the waiting room feature so that you know uh, if a name appears as to whether you're expecting them to be in the space or not. Uh, and being familiar with things like being able to dismiss people from the meeting uh, if it does turn out that someone's uh, got hold of the link uh, and um, access that, that you, you don't want to be in that space. They're all really important features to be using uh, to make sure those spaces are kept safe. Um, also thinking about safeguarding ahead of time. So thinking about the how, what your actions you're gonna take if something does happen and what possible things might happen uh, during a meeting. So things that are included in our risk assessment are uh, things like unwanted uh, guests coming into the meeting. Uh, and we find it particularly useful to restrict who can screen share and who can send things like files uh, in the chat because they're the, the main ways of um, the main risks that can be posed through both computer viruses and to unwanted content uh, and dangerous content being shared uh, with children and young people. So in terms of hours, we send our links uh, via email weekly and don't put them on social media. Um, we find that really important to make sure uh, that our spaces uh, for the young people we're working with, they know they're going to be safe and they know who might be the other people in the room. Uh, you might have different approaches depending how public your event is, uh, but especially where you're working uh, with uh, children and young people trying to make sure that you uh, know beforehand who's going to be in the room and who to expect in the room and controlling that by who actually has the link and the ability to find the room in the first place. Um, we ensure that all, the, all of our spaces online when we're delivering to groups have two adults and both of those adults have gone through our vetting and DBS uh, process. Um, so that similarly as we would in a face-to-face -face space, um, we're treating the online space in a, in a similar way in terms of the trusted adults who are overseeing that space. And then I think the other thing to think about in terms of creating safe spaces is about how you engage with young people, particularly who might have limited access to internet or the software. And that's a really important consideration in uh, the platform you use and expectations around whether you have cameras on. Different platforms use different amounts of data if you're gonna have young people who have to join on their phone. Um, so it's something to bear in mind uh, as to uh, the access uh, you're uh, trying to create and um, whether those young people are likely to be doing it in the safety of their home or if they're going to be out and about and more likely to be on a mobile device. I'm going to pass back to Katie for the, the next section. Um, the next thing that I'd like to discuss is um, setting a pattern for when you meet up. Um, and 
kind of making it special in your own way. So in all of our social groups, we always start off um, with a name game, um, which I'll get into later. Um, but we also have like really goofy traditions, like we always have to have carrots and hummus and Oreos. Um, and it's like a huge inside joke for everyone to participate in. Um, so I really encourage you to set your own traditions. Um, we also regularly have group agreements. So this is like um, rules <laughs> that the young people set for themselves um, because they're setting them themselves are more likely to comply and it's like an easier more relaxed space and sometimes it's more serious like i need a trigger warning before you say anything about the dentist if you're going to say anything about the dentist say trigger warning and i'll be able to leave and come back and and that's like setting up the protocol of how to keep that person safe and relaxed in that space um Sometimes groups, group agreements are things like keep your phone away until the last 30 minutes or nobody put wheat into the hummus, please. Like things like that. They come up with their own group agreements. And then we put in things to help um, that are like respect everybody's pronouns and don't share your contact information and the, then if they have a question about that it opens up a discussion of why you shouldn't do that online and uh in the beginning of lockdown i used to put the group agreements that we came up with in the the first couple of sessions um right with the link so you have to read the agreements before you go in and i don't think you have to do it every time i don't but whenever you return to those group agreement sessions where you kind of review and you talk about it, um, it's good to put them next to the link um, so everybody's aware of the space. And sometimes if I have an individual that I sense is very anxious about something happening, I'll even repeat certain group agreements like the trigger warning especially, like go over that very securely so that way they feel comfortable in that space um you should also come into the session knowing what you're going to do right when you start um so you say hello welcome everyone today we're going to do xyz and you can even like um if you don't have a predictable schedule you can say we're going to do this and this and this and then we'll be done by this time and that kind of helps people keep on track um, and if you know what activities or what subjects you're going to be talking about ahead of time, um, it's best to give them a heads up so you can put it in a newsletter, you can put it on social media, um, you can say at today's meeting next week we're going to do ABC so that way they have enough time to um, get the materials they might need, research what they need to research um and then feel prepared to engage in what you're going to be working on um you also need to include everyone by not assuming who's in the room someone might be in there with um a disability that they're not talking about um they haven't spoke about yet um so that that's why you make the entire environment safe for everyone and and you'll be far more likely to get or engagement from other people because it's an easier space to join in. Uh, the top tip, never underestimate your audience's knowledge, or uh, sorry, my thing's in the way. Yeah, never, never overestimate your audience's knowledge and never underestimate their intelligence. And that's especially true with young people. Although sometimes they do put up a front like they know everything. Okay. Um, so these are just some practical tips we've learned along the way. Um, two screens is better than one. So right now I just had that problem where I had to move things around. If I had two monitors, I could kind of put my notes on one and my presentation on the other. Um, make sure that if you're sharing your screen, your tabs are and your bookmarks are appropriate because they 
young people zoom in on that to make sure that you don't have anything silly that they can tease you about. Um, a big thing for us is that um, feedback is a problem. So we have worked with our young people to like build up a habit of when you're not talking, turn off your mic, but like feel free to turn it on whenever. Just um, the feedback is a problem and I might mute you if uh, I suspect I hear your mom calling in the background, I'll, I might meet you. It's good to just let people know that in the beginning so that way they don't get startled when they're muted and think, okay, I can't talk anymore, I've been muted. Um, a lot of our young people are not out or they're anxious or for whatever reason, they don't wanna have their, their mics on and they don't wanna have their cameras on or, or they just can't be for safety reasons. Um, Sometimes it's anxiety. I, that's the people that I'll, I'm more likely to encourage. But a lot of the times it's just trying to get them in the door. Check out the space, you know, get to know people. You can still participate in the chat and just check it out. And I've had people who have come and left early or come several times and then they've been there four or five times and then they're finally ready and they turn their mic on and they turn their camera on it and it's a big deal um, for their development, but it's just a big deal in general. Um, you should always log in ahead of time to check everything is working. We did that today. That was helpful. Um, you might have noticed the waiting room. That's also good. Um, especially when like I use it mostly when I have one to one uh, conversations with people. Um, cause I, I'll get there several minutes in advance, but if it's also, you know, five minutes until everybody else is going to get here, um, I'll keep them in the waiting room and send them a text or something until everybody's around. Um, and the, so you, so you can, uh, put whatever name you want in the settings here. And you can keep your mic off and you can keep your camera off. So how do we know who that is? So we just agree with everyone that you'll use a name that the staff person can recognize. And I've had young people who just say, I'm just gonna put my initials, but that's me. And so then I know that I know who it is. And then that's still fine. Um, but we had a problem of people coming in with like anonymous or call unknown caller and with those people, you just dismiss them because you don't know who it is. So it's important to point that out. And then with, um, with zoom, you can do a breakout room and I, I've usually experienced that in big conferences when they want to split us into small groups. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a really valuable tool and you should think about how you can use it um, because you can still break into small groups even virtually, <laughs> which is helpful. Okay, and now <clears throat> these are just some tips on how to get young people to engage. Um, you can set clear tasks um and then remind them to get back in touch afterwards so we'll do a craft together and i'll, I'll prompt people oh what are you writing for this what are you saying for that and uh, oh i like that etc and then at the end i'll say oh send me a picture of that i'll put it on our social media or i'll put it on our uh our mini newsletter that has only young people content and then all the young people can see your work it'd be amazing um, and then you can also include that content into the next, next session if you're working on a bigger project. Um, so definitely cl collect feedback. Sometimes that's a, a survey, but a lot of the time for me, it's one-to-one -one conversations where I'm like, how was, how did that go for you? How can we make it better? Things like that. And then don't just sit on it. Make sure that you act on it, otherwise they won't open up and tell you again. Um, you should find out where your audience is and what they're checking out. Um, for us, they said Discord, and we really did check it out, but it just wasn't the place for us because of safeguarding reasons. 
Um, but then they said they really check out Twitter and Instagram the most and not really Facebook. So we've really focused a lot of our effort on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and if you use a service like we do for MailChimp, a lot of the times it'll tell you the ratio of how many people have opened it um, and at what time. So you can, uh, you can try different times of releasing it to see if it gets better, um, or you can just see how many people have opened it. Um, and I think we've done this in the past where you can bring a friend. Um, so typically our engagement services, you, you come in, you have to like do a little bit of admin with uh, a youth worker and we get to know you a little bit, but even that can be a little intimidating and you're not sure if you really want to get started. So bring a friend sessions, I think are very valuable. Um, and we've done that in the past, mostly in the summer, I think. Okay, so this is just an example of a game plan. And um, I think it's nice to, to lay it out in a flow chart like this so you can keep your expectations and your schedule on board. A lot of the time, um, we will combine the first three. So the name game, the icebreaker, and then just through general chat, you can understand you know, how much they know about the subject. Um, and that's part of our name game. Sometimes I have the icebreaker relate to the activity. Um, like one time we did, um, we're all Kite Trust Scouts and you have to make your own bad, badge. What would your badge be? And then so they would say their badge. I'm like, cool, now draw it. And so we, draw, we drew it out and we showed it at the end. Um, did you like that? Should we do this again? and you know send us photos etc so trial and error we've we've found some activities that work really well online um one time we did a geography game where you have to name all the capitals of the whole world and i'm a bad speller and i had to be the one to type everything in but then they're so smart that they spelled everything out for me and that I think is one of the best activities because everybody's on the same level, everyone's participating. People who are in the chat can participate and actually it's better because now you can spell it for me. <laughs> and then um, it's just, yeah, the, I think the level, the level playing field is the best thing because no one's shouting over one another. It's, oh, I didn't know that one. Does anyone know that one? Um, and everyone gets to be kind of a hero of their moment. I thought it was really cool. Um, of course, you can do things that have no materials like conversation games, guessing games, um, scavenger hunt. So um, find something in your house that starts with the letter P and show us and tell us all about it. Or find five, um, find five objects in your house that have all different colors of the rainbow or find six reused materials, you know, you can tailor it to what you um, are talking about and working on and everybody gets a turn and you can still participate in the chat. Um, we've worked on some interview skills that's helpful for the podcast. Um, I think other youth workers are better at drama, so they've done drama exercises. Um, cooking along, so everybody's cooking the same dish or you cook a dish and you bring it and have it all together and talk about it. Um, that one I've done with my bake club, but I'm keen to do it with the young people. Um, but mostly I do this um, set task and feedback. So I, I'll call it doodle in a chat where I have like a constructive, you know, artistic journaling type exercise, like a prompt. And then we just talk about what's going on in our lives, um, any problems that they might be having or opinions or shows. And when there's a lull in the conversation, I can kind of pick uh, individual young people who I know are gonna be comfortable with it. And I say, oh, Ryan, what, how do you feel about, you know, what, what's your pro con or whatever, you know, fill out this part of 
um, the activity and say it out loud, and then we have something new to talk about. Um, and this includes me, the wallflowers. This is always me, um, where I'm kind of nervous. And so I need a little bit of support when I go into a group. And so I find that I do better with the, the kids that are wallflowers because I say, just get in there, you, you know, use the chat. You don't have to do or say anything, just be in there. And next time it'll get easier. Um, I have kids that are so nervous they don't want to use the chat, so they text me on my work phone. And then I say, oh, I just had an idea. And I contribute their idea um, without having to pull them in because they're quite shy. Um, so just like what Pip is doing for us, Pip is monitoring the chat for questions. Uh, that's what I usually do for a volunteer. Either the volunteer is speaking and I'm watching the chat or vice versa because this is a spot where people are answering the question that we might be talking about, contributing to the conversation, or saying a problem that they have that they want to discuss, or, you know, telling me what the capital of Argentina is. Um, but it's really important, and I found, the, I found that the most engaging way to get young people to do things are to have a one-to-one -one connection with them and really encourage them um, by saying what they're good at. Hey, I noticed you're really good at this. You should do this opportunity. You're artistic. We're working on an art project. Come on in. Um, and then after that, they go on there. They keep coming and they keep doing their own thing. Uh, and they might even encourage other young people. So definitely don't undervalue the amount of time that you spend speaking one-on-one -on -one to people to encourage them. Um, and it's important that you know what your role is. So you're not their teacher. You don't have the same rules as their teacher. You're not their pre peer, so they can't be completely informal with you, but you are positive and you are on their side. Um, and like I said, building the connections, encourage them to participate. And when they do go, oh my gosh, it's amazing. It, who cares what you did? The fact that you did it is amazing. Um, and it's totally in the wheelhouse of the youth worker to be extra. And I am often. More people should. Um, so what you say matters. And, and a lot of the times the kids don't complain about the things that are said directly to them. They're, they complain about something they heard just out of earshot about things they can't do or thing, opportunities that they won't be able to engage in. Um, so when you speak, make sure that you're speaking with hope and with diversity that it's important that we get all these different opinions in um, and perspectives. Um, I think the main thing that we get from training is that um, people will say like, hey guys, what's going on guys? And they say guys a lot or other gendered things. So we really encourage like, hello everyone or what's going on fam or whatever. I don't know what people say these days, but I usually say hello everyone. <laughs> and uh, I, I find that that includes everyone, not, not just LGBTQ people, but just everyone. Um, and I think that genuine compliments and feedback can be difficult for people. Um, they tend to say like, that's great. That's wonderful. That's great. That's wonderful. That's lovely. That's brilliant. But if you can say like, oh, I really like your performance arts piece because X, Y, Z, or like, oh, I really enjoyed the submission for the merch competition that you put in because it's so bright and colorful. I think that's the right track. Um, they'll know that you're actually engaging and you're trying, and you're, it's not a blanket statement. And, and those compliments can really stick with them for a long time, the smallest thing. Cool. So I'm kind of a nervous person. Whenever I started, I, I came in with some ideas of things that I was going to say so I could make sure that I was being inclusive. And it's not like the most natural conversation. 
Um, so I had some ideas and phrases prepped ahead of time so I would know what to say kind of in the moment. Because in this, in this instance, you're the source of knowledge, but you wanna know what's going on with them. You wanna turn it to where you're not talking about you and yourself. You wanna talk about them and, and their opinions. Um, so having some easy transitions can be helpful. Um, I especially like the bottom one where it's, hey, I noticed you're good at this. And hey, I noticed you're good at this. You guys should work together. Wouldn't that be awesome? You know a lot about history and culture. You, you've got the math. Let's put it together. And then you're helping people make friends because it can be hard. Okay, here's social media. This is the big fish here. There are so many different kinds of social media and they change all the time. But the most reliable ones right now that I found have been Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. Um, so Instagram, there's a couple different ways that you can reach people. Your stories are eliminated after 24 hours. So this is a cool opportunity to say like, hey, don't forget we have training tonight at six. See you there. Or don't forget to come to art workshop or the podcast is recording or the new podcast episodes out. Uh, like things that you don't need to see forever but are helpful and people are more likely to click on them because they're at the top all the time versus like scrolling through your whole uh, feed. So the feed is there for things that might be there a little bit longer or like check out this project we worked on or you know, things that you wanna add hashtags to to reach other people. And then direct messaging, the DMs, Young people will send us stuff like, hey, have you seen this? Can you do something about this? Um, hey, I'm interested in your service. I wanna get involved. So they haven't seen our website. They've just seen our, our Instagram and that's because we use certain hashtags or location, Cambridge. Um, so it's really valuable to check the DMs there as well. And it's just like another way for them to get in contact. Uh, Twitter is more a pips game. Um, it's like the news of the day and you can reblog things and post someone in it. <laughs> Pip, do you want to say something about Twitter maybe? Yeah, I think about Twitter, but also about all of these platforms is that um, whilst you can create uh, like in so many ways kind of private spaces by using things like video calls, um, you can very much if your conversation is appropriate to be held in a public sphere you can use uh, these different platforms to also have those conversations in what might be uh, less barriers to you don't necessarily have to opt in to receiving the link and signing up to a whole hour session uh, so one of the things we did uh, a couple of weeks into lockdown is uh, we did use our instagram stories to do a um, question and answer session with myself from the young people because I was relatively new uh, into the role uh, and Instagram stories has a feature where you can uh, essentially put a box to say what question do you want to ask or what's your response to this question and then you receive those in as kind of direct messages and you can respond back to them in stories and create a conversation that way. Similarly with Twitter you can say a, a certain day or a certain hour is going to be uh, a takeover or a certain person is on there to answer questions uh, and open that up for people to really dip in and out of uh, and it might be really uh, kind of low low barriers to being able to to access something when someone might not want to sign up uh, to to access a, a whole video call um, kind of space about it yeah absolutely thank you um Facebook, we mostly use for parents group now because the young people told us very directly they don't use it, but the parents do. So we send out the reminders through Facebook and general inquiries. We have a presence there, but it's uh, minor at the moment. And TikTok, we don't do that. Young people ask us a lot and I just can't. I think Pip's done it once on the collaborative um, gig, but not through Kai <laughs> 
So have, have a young person, if they're, if they're excited about it, have them do it and run, run it in your name with you so you can make sure it's appropriate. But yeah, it's beyond me. Okay, um, so I've learned a lot about making images. I've not been a social media person before this really. Um, just through different resources, I've learned a couple of things, figured out what I like. So we'll start off with things you should do. So you should have high contrast. So people with low vision, the best contrast for them is a black background with um, like highlighter yellow print. So that's what our newsletter is always written in. Uh, and when I get an opportunity, I try and make sure that it's like a really light color on a really dark background. Um, you'll want your font to be block style. Um, I know some of my images are like sometimes askew, but that's not the best. Um, it's better if it's like really plain uh, font for people's eyes to track properly. Um, so be aware of like, although they're really pretty, when you combine several different fonts, it can be harder to read the information. Um, so like with the I'm socially distancing with, um, with that image, I wrote directly underneath it what was in the image. Um, so even though it might be a little hard to read for some people, they still have access to the information, knowing that that font might be harder. Um, you don't want to have a lot of stuff on your um, on your image. You just want to catch someone's attention and then they'll click on it um, to read the description. And uh, you'll want to be cohesive with your brand. So when opportunity strikes, I always use Kite Trust colors. Um, we don't have a particular font at the moment, but we might in the future. Um, so the sky's the limit post, that's my updated uh, banner. But I started talking to a young person about graphic design and they're gonna make me an even better one. So I just made these on uh, canva.com, which is free. And if you're a nonprofit, eventually you'll become, <laughs> uh, you'll get a free subscription. We're still working on ours, but even without a paid, free subscription. We have some really good images that we use for our newsletter and all of our social media, uh, which is very helpful and a lot easier than what I used to do. Highly recommend. And so these are the things that you should not do. Um, you shouldn't have a lot of distracting movement. You shouldn't have um, pastel colors that are really hard to read. Um, and it should like flow a little bit more cohesively. Um, you shouldn't have tons of information on the flyer um, because it just mumbles it up. Um, and you should have high contrast on your images. Um, otherwise, you won't be able to really see what is being said. And it shouldn't overlap with other images. You want to keep like block as much as you can. Um, and this is my first, you can tell I've learned because this is my first banner for the newsletter, the sky's the limit post. And I use that on, um, I think we use that for email signatures in the past, but because it's like all slanty and hard to read, I replaced it. Um, something else I wanna, I'm trying to work on a little bit more. I don't do it all the time, but I want to is to describe the image. So if you have low vision, uh, or a learning disability that makes it hard to read things, you can get an app that reads all the descriptions out loud. So if you are on Instagram and there's a block of text with the description of the image, then you can still get the information. So this is a, an image from the newsletter and a, an example for the Description would be this, that there are books spread out on a table as well as stacked into a tower. And then I quoted the text verbatim. And you can also, the whole purpose of putting this image out was to show how many different kinds of books and look at some of the titles right away. So you might also include the titles. And um, if it's a lot of information, you can always say email 
this person for more information or DM us. So this is another example. This is one of my favorite <laughs> from, and I and I like reblog them and use them on my newsletter. Anyway, the the description for this one would be an illustration of a bald, smiling person in a cozy jumper. Um, you'll want to keep the description as plain as possible, simple as possible, and it's also uh, a great opportunity to use inclusive language. Um, yeah, you can do it. So hopefully now that we're through, you know a little bit more about all these complex situations, how to keep uh, an online space safe and comfortable and welcoming for all kinds of different young people. Um, hopefully you have a couple of tools in the tool belt for working with young people and making them feel included. And hopefully you know a little bit more about social media and communication uh, with those young people. So I'll open up the floor here. Does anyone have any questions? I've got a question that was in the middle of typing, but as you've opened up the floor, I'll ask. Um, I was wondering what experience do you have of using uh, the online surveys or the quiz questions to try and generate um, feedback and interaction from participants? Um, because sometimes when you're sitting like you are now, Katie, it feels very distant from your audience and you're desperate for feedback and interaction. Um, and yet as a participant, a lot of us aren't brave enough to uh, speak out loud. Um, so I wondered if, have you used things like Mentimeter or the Zoom uh, data surveys and have they been successful? Um, you know, we have so many surveys that other people request us to do that we haven't done a lot of surveys for our young people um like formal google ones we do have a mentor program that we have a short survey about but that's more of a get to know you survey um right now most of the feedback comes from like one-to-one -one communication but i do think that it's very helpful to do a survey especially if you don't have a lot of one-to-one -one connections to start with um make sure that it can be anonymous if they want it to be anonymous but if they have their name on it then you can also follow up with them later and pull them out a little bit more um, one of the things i found really helpful is that we did a um a collaboration with some artists and they had some supplies that we wanted to send out and um we sent out these wonderful art supplies and then I said, hey, if anybody wants to share their artwork, please do. And just one or two people out of like 20 did. And uh, then the artist asked for them to fill out a survey and probably about seven of them did. And they really did spend time on it. And they said, wow, thank you so much for doing this. And it, it was an opportunity for to learn about, are they really getting a lot out of this? I'm not sure they haven't said, they're not going to say, oh, this has been very constructive for my development, <laughs> you know, like, um, but they might in a survey. So yeah, Google Google Forms is an easy one. Mm. I think to to add to that's what we found is that to using those kind of tools, it's really important to give uh, actually kind of space to to think about some of the the answers in kind of those surveying and polls, uh, and sometimes the ones um, I've used them in other spaces and having uh them crammed in uh when you have the poll in zoom and someone's still talking at you and their screen sharing can be a lot so i think it can be a useful tool for getting a just kind of uh like finger in the air response to a question if you're getting no feedback whatsoever um, but making sure that there is a bit of a pause so people can uh, focus on just answering that rather than lots of things going on um, but we do tend to use more putting a question out there and telling people that they can respond in the chat instead, which gives a little bit more um, flexibility to how people want to, to respond to it. Um, and it's, 
it's kind of the difference between, I guess, uh, op asking a closed question versus an open question. And when you uh, use a survey and a poll, it's like you're asking a closed question. And if what you want back from your audience is a yes, no to check like levels of understanding or like the speed you're going at, then it can be a really useful tool. But if actually what you're trying to do is pull out that engagement, uh, asking them to respond in the chat or building them up in confidence to respond verbally and have that conversation is like asking the open question yeah. um, so that they have something that hopefully they build in confidence and then start giving you longer feedback uh, and more. So at the very beginning of lockdown, I used Mentimeter because uh, you can do yes, no, close questions, but you can also do sort of post-it notes. But swapping between the Mentimeter platform and Zoom and just making sure that everyone was going with us, it just was too difficult. Um, so your point about giving them time and space to respond is completely true. Um, but trying to make it seamless as well also mm. helps. But thank you. Yeah, I think um, we find that a lot of our young people join on mobile devices. So asking them to switch between platforms is just a bit too complex for being able to stay engaged um, when it's essentially switching the, the apps completely on their phone. Um, whereas where we've been delivering more training with uh, adults who are much more likely to be on a laptop or a desktop, incorporating those tools is actually a lot easier in terms of the technical setup they're joining us with. Um, so it might be different maybe if you're engaging with schools as to what technology they're engaging um, in the online space through. I've got a quick question if I can. Um, I'm reading this, um, is that right? You see it? Greta Thunberg's book at the moment. It's quite a, it's basically it's a, a little book with her um, speeches in it. Um, and I'm interested to know how much the young people that you're working with are interested and are involved in stuff to do with the climate crisis. But also when you were talking about being positive, if you read her book and the way that she talks when she's say in front of the UK Parliament or one of the big international conferences, she is not always positive. She can actually be quite negative sometimes because she says, yeah, this is an emergency. We need to be doing stuff now. So I'm interested to know how much the young people you're working with are involved and know about the climate crisis and what their attitude to it is really. Um, yeah, I think many of our young people are engaged. I think um, they're they're very aware of the problem, and they'll make. Sorry, my dog just. We've been interrupted by Martha Jean, who is Katie's dog. Sorry, her nails, and um, I apologize. Um, That's good. Yeah, no, they're engaged and they know what's going on. I think they don't know exactly what to do about it. Um, I think they feel like it's kind of banging the same drum and they're not getting a lot of response, especially from the government. Um, and they're very negative about that. Um, yeah, mm. I see what you mean about coming at the negative versus the positive, but the negative is kind of like, wake up to the people who are just not listening. Um, sometimes I can be negative by saying like, they're not doing the thing. They're not, this isn't a great situation that we're in, in different words, but we can change it by, but you have control of, but, and then it's still like offering better days on the horizon if you engage. Mm. I think it's it's recognizing that um, perhaps don't mean that positivity means we can't talk about challenges or negative things, but it's uh, about always incorporating messages of hope and of uh, things that are actions that can be taken. And that's been really important. So um, I think the young people we work with, and I think a, a large majority of young people um, uh, around kind of um, concerns around their mental health and some of what that has been particularly difficult over the last six months because so much has seemed out of their control and I think that's a really important thing to bear in mind with talking about the the climate emergency and the climate crisis is 
um, that climate anxiety is also actually a really real thing. Um, but being able to create engagements where whilst young people are learning about really the severity of the problem, alongside that they're learning about concrete ways that um, they can take action and the things and their contributions that they can actually make an individual uh, level and that's a way of uh, giving control over some of that anxiety okay. to give a sense that you can have hope as well for change. Thanks, Pip. Thanks, but I've actually got to go away and start another Zoom meeting on another computer now, so I'm, I'm going to just mute this and um, and go off. So, but I'll cool. still be listening. Thanks for joining us. Cool. I see Colin um, got your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to come back more just to the the technology and the safeguarding and communications aspects. Um, I mean, I, I'm partly in marketing. I teach that actually at the university level. But um, so I'm aware that there can be very positive things about something, quote, going viral. Um, but it can also be very negative, can lead to a lot of, uh, you know, some negative story, obviously. Now, that's mainly for people much more public than the guys that, uh, sorry, <laughs> the people that we're dealing with so must remember not to use that word, which I dislike anyway, because it's an Americanism. Sorry, folks. Um, but uh, what I was wanting to ask about was the, um, how aware are the people that you deal with in that teenage age range? How aware are they of these risks that somebody could be screenshotting them and then posting it if in the worst case or um, taking their post and then forwarding it on to other people or copying their email and sending it on to somebody else, that kind of thing where it was supposedly a private comment or even just a, almost an idle remark, you know, in, in the course of a conversation online, not something that people wanted to be replicated in that way. Are, are they aware of that and those sort of risks? Uh, I think a good portion of them are. Um, we do talk about online safety, social media safety. Um, we don't talk a lot about fallout, like repair if there is a crisis. We're hoping that if there is a crisis, they talk to us and we can assist them at that point. But we, I know, I know we have talked about internet safety, online safety quite a bit um and phishing scams and you and you said that you, you you're basically anonymizing the contact until people are in the meeting so your invitations are going out in blind copy in some way through the mailchimp tool or emails just in bcc without so people don't don't know other people's contact details right. unless they deliberately share them because they've agreed mutually to do that yeah people correct be captured yeah. or stalked in any any uh, any nasty way yeah, yeah. right and in and the beginning one of our group agreements was you know like um in go to meeting which were in there more frequently you can chat individually um so i can send a message to pip and no one else can see it mm -hmm. but the organizer can see it at the end so i said hey please don't and i can see what you're doing um, and then they go, and they did respect it. No one's ever broken that rule, but they did go, why? Why can't we? And it was, um, it was a good conversation and, and we had it a few times. And then we also came up with uh, a reasonable solution because the whole point is that they want to come to a group so they can make friends. But now they can only see that friend when they come to Kite Trust meetings. Like, what's the deal? How can we be friends outside of Kite Trust? So we made a Google form where they say, I want, I want Pip to have my information. Pip, is it cool for you to share with Katie? Yeah, it's cool. It's, and they have to like write all the information that they're fine with sharing. Um, and then we'll switch. And given that option, not a lot of people have um, used it, but it was like, you spoke, you gave me feedback. I heard it's totally reasonable. It's understandable. We had a nice conversation about it. You learn something and now we have a solution for that. And I think we, we uh, one of our age groups for our groups is, is 11 to 18. And I think that age group in particular, and it's not particularly 
the age within that age group, but it's definitely the period in which a lot of our young people are learning about uh, internet safety because their experience and their use of various social media channels is growing. And I know earlier this summer, um, we had quite a few conversations with different individuals on a one-to-one -one basis. There was a, uh, a bit of a scare around a, an incident called Pridefall, um, which was um, this messaging online that the, the alt-right were going to target uh, LGBTQ plus young people during Pride Month um, with, with negative content. And that really opened up a way for a lot of our young people to have conversations and work with us to talk about their security settings and to learn about internet safety. Because if you have lock your account and if you control who can DM you, you have, and if you are only accepting as friends those people who you uh, know in real life or have a connection through somebody else to, so you, so you, you know that they're not necessarily um, trying to befriend you from a malicious uh, point of view. Um, I think it's, it's really important to recognise, I think it goes back to what uh, Katie was saying of not uh, overestimating knowledge, but don't underestimate intelligence of they, there are a lot of young people who won't have encountered, uh, thankfully, negative situations on, on the internet yet with it, but there is scope by engaging them in online spaces and um, creating those group agreements together to be that learning process that they ultimately have that as a, uh, a sustainable skill that they're taking forward into their life, that they know a bit better how to keep themselves safe um, beyond the spaces that they're engaging with us in. Oh gosh, I just saw Blue series. <laughs> Josh, you have a question? Yeah, yeah um, you guys have spoken a lot about a lot of the social media training you've had, or not training, but things that you know. Uh, and it's great that this is being recorded, but um, I like having a few different resources available because uh, I mean, it's nice to watch an hour of people talking about social media, but maybe I want to Google one specific thing or something. So do you have any recommendations about where you guys learn about this kind of thing? Because, uh, yeah, I mean, I had to do something recently for a charity and I was just real lost. Um, one of our staff members is young and talking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that's where, uh, uh, within our youth work team, it was very much peer to peer learning. And I think I thoroughly recommend, uh, both peer to peer learning and, um, the young people you're working with as well. I don't know in terms of the, the scope of the things you're working on in terms of creating projects, um, but being open to learning as much from the young people you're working with as um, the, the different expertise that um, you're bringing to the situation too. Um, I think we have found uh, looking at some of the tools that the, the platforms that we choose to use uh, produce as a, as a really good starting point of uh, trying to unpick like what are all the features you can use in Zoom um, and we did a very much learning by doing uh, approach. And I think that's the, the nature of how we came to doing digital youth work was uh, in, a, in a situation where we used quite a lot of trial and error um, in a sense of uh, we first tried out Google Hangouts and then we found out that you could only have 10 people in them. Um, and then we moved on to go to meeting and really looking at some of those tools that explain what the features are and trying out those different features. Um, to see what enabled young people to, to engage with us the best. Um, yeah, that's, that, I don't, that's not necessarily like links directly to things to go to, but I think definitely check them out. Yeah. Because I think a lot of these platforms have been aware that uh, a lot of people have been thrown in the deep end over the last six months in terms of using them. And I know Zoom and GoToMeeting and the likes of them have been trying to put mm. out things to help people use them to their full potential. Yeah, I think, I mean, I've, obviously <clears throat> with groups of friends or with colleagues or with things to this charity stuff it just almost became like uh what's it called Rem remote darwinism like the the, the best platform survived and then the rest of them didn't uh yeah um the other thing was yeah you're right i the, the the main person who actually helped me with my instagram charity stuff with my sister she's younger than me 
Yeah, but I also did some individual research. I mean, research. I looked at vloggers and bloggers, and and a lot of the time they like to talk about how great they are and how their process has been helpful. And yeah. so I just picked up tips from them. Also, some of the information I got on building graphics was from disability resources. Um, and I have a background in working with low, low vision patients. And so I knew that was my own experience. Um, but definitely like the audio side, I learned from disability how to include more people that way. But yeah. And they ask a young person because they love making you feel like an ancient old fogey that you don't know. Um, it's a good time. <laughs> Colin, yeah, you have a question. Yeah, just another question really about your experience with the folks that you're working with. Do they understand the difference between facts and opinions on social media in particular? Um, I believe so. I think um good things ha that i've talked about with young people has been look at the resource and how can you make sure that the resource is um reliable because you can get any old fact and uh, offline but where is that information coming from and yeah there was a study done but how do you know it's a good study and i feel like that's something i, I didn't learn a lot about until i was taking like research and statistics at university and so I just try and drop like little pearls of wisdom like those to make someone go, oh, maybe this isn't a reliable source or good information. Like there's different perspectives, but there's only one fact <laughs> generally. Yeah, I think there's those open questions of, um, and I think it's a, it's a really useful tool in, in working with young people of, um, responding with the kind of questions uh, that don't necessarily tell them that they have that they're wrong or that they've taken the wrong interpretation of something but allowing them to come to those realizations themselves um, so uh, where they might be particularly expressing opinions that might be demonstrating kind of bias or discrimination against someone of uh, just open questions of why do you think that? What led you to, to think that? Uh, and yeah, the, the unpicking, I think quite a lot of the young people have had the kind of uh, lessons in school where particularly like history, where they talk about sources, where you ask those questions about them of who, what, when, where, um, but the, the transferring of that knowledge to the contemporary context, I think is also um, like something that can, can happen through engaging with them. And I think that's, that's a really uh, important thing to bear in mind is that um, I think any group is going to have diversity in it. And I think probably any group of young people, some of them will already be in that place where they know very strongly the difference between like fact and opinion, but others are, uh, maybe just starting to think about that in terms of social media content in particular and, and news from various different sources and it can be a really useful space for them to learn from their peers um, and have those conversations to to develop that understanding further. I, I suppose I'm a bit sensitive to the fact that in the climate and, and uh, ecological area you know, there's a lot of debate about facts <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, even the sources, like even, as you say in history, you know, you have to look at sources, but then who wrote the source, you know, the winners, <laughs> uh, you know, the Celts didn't write many of the history books about English history because they got wiped out by the invaders, you know, uh, or whatever. Um, the same with like the um, first peoples in, in, in America, you know, all those sort of issues that are coming up again now. And same with science, you know, who funded all the research? You know, why is sugar so bad? Um, mm -hmm. Because the dairy companies fund that we make all the fat <laughs> funded the research. Uh, you know, and the guy, the one guy who did the one about, um, uh, sorry, the other way around, the sugar. No, uh, anyway, I can't remember which way around it is now. I have to go back and check mm -hmm. my sources. Um, but that's that's the nature of the problem about some of the science uh, on on climate as well. I think. 
um, mm, and I think some of the and PR from energy companies and you know not that they're not doing some good things but uh, we ourselves this project is funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering which itself is a vested interest in one sense and I say that as a member of one of its institutions I have been for 50 years you know uh, nearly. Mm. Yeah, and I think some of those those like phrases that you've you've just used there are really useful and kind of going back to Katie's slide about having having some of those phrases to help structure conversation of um I think particularly on climate science like having the phrase of so who funded that who did that piece of research and understanding that yes we have facts and opinions but also what is presented like statistics can be played in lots of different ways um, depending on people's people's interests in them and I think that's a really uh, interesting thing to to explore uh, in terms of the work that you're going to be doing um, with young people and I think um, I would definitely say that my experience of working with young people is that they all have the, the ability to to grasp that there is so much nuance in the world and we need to probe these ideas quite quite deeply and think about um the messages that we're being sent and why we're being sent those from different places um not all of them will be in that place when you're engaging with them but that's that's the the richness of this project is that that is a journey that you can help take young people on that is relevant to their lives beyond talking about just the climate emergency that's a that's a skill in being able to to unpick the nuance in in media in social media in news in uh, education about having that kind of critical thinking um, and that's a really transferable skill that critical critical thinking that they can take from this elsewhere in their lives and lots of very young people love I don't want to call them conspiracy theories but they like to read between the lines Oh, that MP is, is funded by XYZ organization. That's why they're voted that way for, you know, that kind of we conversation. Conspired to create the conspiracy theory. Yeah. yeah. But it's true. That's a <laughs> mind blower of it. Great. Wonderful. Cool. Well, um, I th Katie briefly shared a slide that uh, has our email address on it. I will. Uh, pop it in the chat as well and if you like go away from this and have some burning questions that you want to send our way please feel free to and uh, one of us will kind of can answer those as well um, but otherwise thanks very much for for listening to us this evening and um, I wish you the best of luck with the project thank you that was great Thank you, Pip. Thank you, Katie. Uh, as Anne said, that was really useful. Uh, we are going to have um, some interesting online sessions over the next couple of months as said starting with our careers talks and then moving on to some online lessons and we will be pleased that we're actually going to get into a field with some young people next summer fingers crossed so i'll say i'll say good night to everybody and for those uh in the um engineering project a reminder that we've got another session booked on monday uh, and also our blogging sessions coming up on the 21st and 24th of September. So thank you, everybody. Have a lovely weekend. And I'll say good night to you all. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much.